Well, a lot of nervous tension around all the talk of the economy these days, but how much of it is justified? We're about to find out. The bottom line is here with their key indicators for you to consider about the year ahead. Jim Stanford is an economic advisor to Unifor, teaches economics at McMaster University. He's about to desert us and head with his family to Australia tomorrow, right? Tomorrow night. Uh, still got a few bags to pack. Some people go a long way to get rid of uh, winter. <laughs> Preet Banerjee, freelance broadcaster and personal finance commentator. And Leslie Preston, a TD Bank economist. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, this context. You worried? Well, if you are, these are probably the reasons why. The loony, longest losing streak since the 1970s. It's below 69 cents, and at least some experts think even that's overpriced. Sure, it makes exports more attractive, but it makes a lot of other things, like your food, cost a lot more. Oil, it's now below 30 bucks a barrel. Alberta is hurting big time, but it's not alone. Jobs, big picture first. In 1982, the unemployment rate was 13.1. That's the worst it's ever been since they started keeping records. In 1966, it was 2.9. That's the best. Right now, stagnant at just over 7%. Housing, there are sharp corrections in Alberta and Newfoundland where oil is the big employer, but Vancouver and Toronto remain hotter than hot helping the average price of a home in Canada jump 12% last year to over $450,000. And finally, interest rates. Canadians love to borrow. Consumer debt is high, and with mortgages factored in, it's really high. No wonder, given rates that are so low and forecast to go even lower. Does all this sound like we're peering into an abyss that everything means doom? To some, it does. To others, it's an opportunity. Time for some opinions. All right, let's start on the loony. And Preet, you start us off. Is the, the sub 70 cent loony, is that the new reality? Are we going to look at that for a while now? Uh, I think so. It's uh, two major factors that go into it. Uh, you've got the price of oil is lower, and of course the loony is tied to the price of oil to a certain extent. We also have a divergence in monetary policy between Canada and the U.S., where it looks like Canada will either stay firm or go down, while the U.S. will either stay firm and go up. And that divergence further has downward pressure on the loony. Jim. It's always a roller coaster uh, as well, Peter. There's no sort of rationality to the day-to-day -day fluctuations uh, on the exchange markets. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like Mark Twain said about the weather, right? If you don't like it, try again in five minutes because uh, it'll change. And the same will be true. Uh, clearly, it's headed down lower. Um, this big roller coaster tends to center around a, a level, uh, about 80 cents US, uh, which is a good, good judge of the kind of fair value of the currency. So sooner or later it will come back up, but that probably won't be for several years. Any disagreement there, Leslie? Well, I seem to be in the middle of uh, Preet and Jim today. You know, markets really are quite pessimistic at the moment, and that hurts the loony. We don't think the sub-70 cent loony is here to stay. We think the Canadian dollar will trade between 70 and 75 cents really over the next couple of years. And it really is in line with our view that oil prices are going to rise from their current levels, but remain lower than they have been in recent years over the next couple of years. Yeah, it's hard to imagine them going much lower on oil prices, but we'll get to that in a minute. Upside of the uh, low dollar. Uh, well, certainly in the setup pack, you saw exports, mm. manufacturers, uh, tourism industry, and also Hollywood North. So, uh, you know, film studios, filming productions up here used to be big, booming business, and a lot of people were affected when the loony was on the rise, and now it's going to be more enticing for film and tourism. Any uh, additions to that, Les? I think just singling out the domestic tourism sector, and it's not just Americans coming north of the border, you know, to visit Whistler. It's also Canadians can't really afford to go abroad so much anymore, so there'll be more people staying within Canada to travel. And not that there isn't a lot to look at. Yeah. There's lots of places to go. Downside, Jim, you start us on that. Uh, well, obviously, imports uh, are going to be more expensive, although some of that does not get passed through to the consumer. There's a, a certain limited pass-through where the company that's importing products to sell them to the consumer has to swallow some of the change in their own margin. So I don't think you'll see a big hit on consumer prices, but in some imported products, like the food uh, that you mentioned, you, you will. Um, obviously, traveling abroad is going to be much more expensive. Um, if it got out of hand and it was a really dramatic change, then there could be a kind of intangible psychological effect where people are just worried uh, about what it means. But, uh, you know, looking at the, at the fundamentals of it, it's actually a good thing. It's helping Canada adjust to this big, big shock. In terms of the upside, I would echo what Jim was saying. It really, um, it helps exporters. 
in terms of their competitiveness abroad. You know, any exporter who invoices their customers in U.S. dollars is bringing more Canadian dollars home at the end of the day. So it gives a boost to exporters. And um, it is offset a little bit, it's good to point out, by rising cost of imported inputs. So depending on what industry you're in and how much of your costs are imported, really can uh, help dampen the boost you get from the weaker Canadian dollar. All right, jobs. We've been, we're looking at the situation. We're kind of stuck around the 7% mark, not moving down, not moving up dramatically. Uh, yet there are people hurting out there, and there are sectors hurting. Uh, aside from the energy sector, who's hurting? Uh, well, I was going to say, uh, listen, if, unless mm -hmm. you're in the energy uh, sector, that's, I mean, that's where you're feeling it the most. Um, I travel to Calgary probably once every four to six months over the last two years, and it's palpable the difference you see when you're there. You know, you used to struggle to find parking and, and get a reservation at a restaurant. You don't have any of those problems today. So they're really feeling it in the energy intensive regions. Is that the major area, Jim, then? Uh, there's been a spillover. Mining, uh, other commodity mm -hmm. industries. We, we heard about today. that, that bad right. news in New Brunswick. Uh, accommodation, hospitality uh, is an industry that seems to be shrinking right now in terms of employment. Perhaps because people are worried about the future so they don't go out for that, that restaurant meal or something. I'm not sure why. Um, if you break it down by age, it's young people, as usual, uh, who are getting the short end of the job stick. Uh, youth, uh, youth employment fell by 50,000 positions last year, and it was, unemployment was too high already for, for young people. So, uh, as usual, they're the last hired, first fired. All right, Leslie, let's move it to who's faring well in the job market right now. Who is? Well, I think if you're working in healthcare, you're faring well. A lot of the job gains we saw in 2015 were in the healthcare sector. Generally, public sector hiring was stronger than we saw in the private sector, which was relatively flat for the year. And then regionally, if you look at a province like Ontario, over 2015, Ontario saw its unemployment rate fall over the course of the year. So central Canadian provinces uh, doing better. Interestingly, BC had the strongest employment gains in 2015, but so many people flooded into the BC labour market, it saw its unemployment rate still rise. I wanted to, to point out, so with the Ontario numbers, I noticed that as well, but over 50% of the gains in Ontario over 2015 was in the real estate or real estate-related industries, mm. which I'm sure we'll circle back to because we mm. can't have a panel without talking about housing. No, and we will get to housing, <laughs> but not until we talk about oil. Um, Jim's made some forecasts over the past year, but the only one we talk about is the forecast <laughs> that clearly is on the right path, and that's oil. You were saying down to 20 bucks. It's not there yet, but it is on a way down. Well, uh, Peter, if you throw enough darts at the dartboard, sooner <laughs> or later, you're going to hit the uh, middle, and uh, that might be one. Um, I, I think it's headed, I think my prediction will be right. In fact, it may turn out to be conservative. It could very well go below $20. It's falling. There's negative sentiment. The speculators, remember, there's many barrels of oil that are bought and sold on the futures market for every barrel that's actually produced and consumed. And the speculators are very uh, uh, pushing the market downward. And you're going to have some other things happen. Iran, for example, it's a great thing that you've got a, you know, some peace accord with Iran and the sanctions are coming off, but that does mean they're going to be pumping a lot more oil into world markets. So for a number of reasons, you're going to see that price continue to fall and likely stay there for several years. Well, you know, we have control over all the other issues we've right. talked about, but it seems we have zero control on oil, on the price of oil. Yeah, it's not something that we can influence, but with all the predictions out there, and I've seen doomsday predictions of $10 a barrel, mm. and I've seen as high as 60 If you look at the futures market, if I'm not mistaken, they're pricing 35 36 by the end of the year. And absent any new information, you know, with people who have skin in the game, I think that might be a pretty good uh, proxy for your, for your forecast in oil. You, you know, we, we clearly have, have seen who the losers are on, on this oil, and you talked about the situation in Alberta. It's it kind of echoed somewhat in Saskatchewan and Newfoundland as well. What about winners with the low price of oil? I think if you look at the global economy, the winners are the key oil importing economies. The Eurozone's a big one, Japan. The US economy, don't forget, despite the shale boom we've seen in recent years, is still a net oil importer. So it is a boost to businesses and consumers' bottom lines in the United States. Jim? And anyone in Canada who uses energy is obviously benefiting the transportation industry, airlines, railroads, etc. cetera, uh, get a little bit of uh, extra fat on, on uh, on their margin. Consumers are going to get some savings uh, at the pump, but it's never proportional because the profit margins on the refining and gas station end of the business always go up when the oil price comes down. So I was, I was going to echo yeah. that because people are probably wondering, oil is so low yeah. and yet the price at the pumps is a lot higher than they would think. And uh, one analyst was suggesting that because the bulk of the refining is done in the U.S. and they've expanded their margins as how they respond mm -hmm. to what's going on, it's 
costed in U.S. dollars. So when it comes back up here, that explains why it may not be as low as we would hope or expect. And it that to be. itself is an incredible story. Canada is supposed to be this big energy superpower, but we're now a net importer of refined petroleum products, including the gasoline that we put in our own tanks that comes from the United States. So we aren't even capturing the full gain uh, that happens when the oil price falls. All right. The housing bubble. You mentioned mm -hmm. housing, Preet. Uh, and before we take our break, I want to uh, I want to focus on uh, it for a second. And uh, Leslie, you start us off. Um, what's driving the continuing uh, rising prices in housing? Well, the short answer to that is low interest rates. Earlier in 2015, we saw a 55 basis point drop in the mortgage rate, and in the economies that were faring relatively better, like Ontario and BC that really provided an added boost to the housing markets there in those re regions. But I would argue for Canada as a whole, there are a lot of markets, as was mentioned in the intro, that are really in decline at this point. Yeah, there certainly are. As, as you say, we mentioned Alberta and Newfoundland. Um, are we in a bubble? You know, and if we are in a bubble, is it going to burst? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, two co-winners in the uh, Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2013 are diametrically opposed as to whether or not a bubble even exists in the first place. So two of the smartest people on the planet in economics can't even figure out if bubbles exist or not. Far from the course, disagree. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 That being said, you know, you take a look at how long this bull run has been in real estate, fueled by low interest rates, and also foreign ownership, which we can't quantify how big of an issue that is, but with the drop in the price of the loony, houses relative to a foreign buyer are 30% off what they were a year ago. Uh, so it's got a lot of legs, and every market corrects. It's just a matter of when, and we can't time it, and how severe, which we don't know. Jim? Uh, it's possible. You know, everybody would hope for a small, uh, a soft landing rather than some kind of sharp, uh, sharp price decline. Because if you get the sharp price decline, then you can really have some havoc in financial markets. If people are uh, foreclosing, they can't afford the, the mortgage anymore, the housing price falls, and then people mortgage their home, you know, for other purchases. So hopefully it's a soft landing. And, and of course, I mentioned before, 50, more than 50% of the new jobs in Ontario were in real estate and real estate related industries. As a size of the economy, housing-related industries are sort of punching above their weight class. All right. We're going to take that short break I was talking about, but when we come back, this question. What indicator is no one talking about that we should be considering? And welcome back to The Bottom Line. Jim, Preet, and Leslie all at the table tonight. Okay, what's the one thing that we haven't talked about, one indicator that you'll be looking at in the year ahead, Leslie? Well, look, there's been a lot of doom and gloom tonight on this mm -hmm. panel, but overall, I do expect the Canadian economy to turn out modest growth this year. So what I'll be watching for is non-energy exports. It's really what we're counting on to drive Canada's growth going forward is a pickup in exports driven by a stronger U.S. economy. So that's what I'll be watching closely to make sure that transition is happening and that Canada is getting that boost from faster U.S. growth. And plus a lower Canadian dollar yep. should help exports, as we said, pre. Uh, well, what we haven't talked about, but I know a lot of people at home are thinking about, is their investment portfolios in light of all this doom and gloom. And what I want to say to people is that, you know, um, historically speaking, the most, the biggest mistake that investors make and most often repeated mistake is making changes to a properly constructed portfolio out of reaction of fear of what's going on in the short term. So I would say that if you are having second thoughts, talk to someone about your portfolio. Don't make changes out of fear, because again, historically, one of the biggest mistakes people make. All right, Jim. Um, <clears throat> we talked about oil, the dollar. Uh, I'm you know, watching those with some concern. The thing that could really cause havoc to break out in the global, uh, the global economy would be a breakdown or seizing up again of the financial system as we experienced in 2008, 2009. Um, obviously, you've got a lot of leveraged investments uh, that have been made, people who are you know, placing speculative bets. What happens if enough fear from all of this market turmoil starts to freeze things up? So one indicator of that is a special interest rate called LIBOR, the London Interbank mm -hmm. Rate, which is the rate by which banks charge each other money for overnight lending. And if you started to see a kind of a rise in fear among the banking community and an increase in that interest rate, we have not seen that yet, that's where you would start to worry about a more serious financial rupture of the sort that we've experienced back in 08. All right, a quick round the table on, on the point actually that, that Leslie mentioned. That the, while there is a lot of doom and gloom here at the table yes. tonight, she has some optimism uh, for the future. Where are you on that, on that meter? More optimistic? 
and pessimistic? Preet. I think we have to accept that over the short term, there's always periods of economic uncertainty. And over the long term, we're relatively well positioned. Um, I wouldn't focus too much attention on the short term. I think long term, we have muted expectations of growth. And that may be the new normal, but it's not all doom and gloom. Jim. I may be on the slightly gloomier uh, end of that. Uh, I think globally you have a, an economy, an economic system that just hasn't been able to find its footing, you know, uh, whether that's China, whether that's Europe. Uh, America is the only place where it's really a bit more consistent. And even there, by historical standards, the growth is quite modest. Um, so, um, you know, whether it's an all-out recession or not, uh, I, I wouldn't worry too much, but we are certainly in a situation where we aren't utilizing our potential uh, to, to lift our standard of living and produce the goods and services uh, that we need. Some things will help. The uh, export, uh, non-energy exports that Leslie mentioned is one. The government stimulus that's coming, the big infrastructure program that the new federal government was elected on will help significantly. Uh, but we need other, other sources of spending power and optimism to, to get us out of this funk. All right, we're going to leave it at that. We're going to wish you great luck in Australia. Thank you, sir. We'll miss you, Jim, but I know you're going to be back every yes, once in a while. I will we'll as often as I can. We'll have you in to give us any lessons that we may learn from what's happening in Australia. Leslie, it's great to have you with us. Tonight. Pleasure to be here. Okay.